Welcome to another episode of our Pirkei Avot Shior, and we're going to be starting the second Perek. We're mega excited. We've already done one Perek in full. It's been a really wonderful experience so far. So we'd like to dedicate this episode as ever to Levi Bomosheva Esther and Elishavayel Bat Lea, and also in memory of Rosie Bat Moshe Ve Esther. Okay, Michael, take it away. Thank you, Baba Mashiach. So uh, we're going to start chapter two, the first uh, Mishnah, and we're going to introduce uh, a very important um, uh, person, this Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, uh, who was the author of the Mishnah. And I'll give you a, um, a quick biography of the uh, of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Um, was a second century rabbi, a Tana of the fifth generation and the chief author and editor of the Mishnah. He lived from approximately 135 to 217 uh, common era and he was a key leader in the Jewish community during the Roman occupation of Judea. The title Nasi was used for president of the Sanhedrin. He was the first Nasi to have this title added permanently to his name. In traditional uh, literature, he is usually called Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, uh, although uh, he's often simply called Rabbi. Um, he was a master par excellence, uh, in other words. Uh, he's occasionally called Rabbeinu, and also uh, referred to as Rabbeinu HaKadosh, um, due to his deep piety. So he was born to uh, uh, Shimon ben Gamliel II. Uh, according to the Talmud, he was of the Davidic, Davidic uh, lineage. He is said to have been born on the same day that Rabbi Akiva died as a martyr. Um, the Talmud suggests that this was as a result of divine providence. Hashem had granted the Jewish people another leader of great stature to succeed Rabbi Akiva. Uh, his place of birth is unknown, but he spent his youth in the city of Usha. His father presumably gave him the same education that he, he himself has received, including he was able to speak the Greek language. This knowledge of the Greek language enabled him to become the Jews' intermediary with the Roman authorities, and he was very kind of highly regarded. He favored Greek as the language of the of uh, the country over the uh, Aramaic uh, that was prevalent at the time. Um, and apparently he was a great, uh, a great um, linguist of the Hebrew language. And even his servants sometime in his house couldn't understand the, the complex uh, Hebrew grammar that he used or Hebrew words he used. Uh, Rabbi Yudha Nasi devoted himself to the study of the oral and the written law. He studied under some of Rabbi Akiva's most eminent students. As their students and, and through converse with other prominent men who gathered around his father, he laid a strong foundation of scholarship for his life's work, the editing of the Mishnah. So who were some of his teachers? Uh, one of his teachers was Usha. Uh, at Usha was uh, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli, who was officially employed in the house um, of his father as a judge in religious and legal questions. Um, in later years, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi described how in his childhood he read the Book of Esther at Usha in the presence of Yehuda Bar Eli. Was Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli as in Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon, whose names are all over the Gemara? Um, he felt a special uh, reverence for Rabbi Yosef ben Halafta. He was a student of Akiva's who had the closest relationship with Shimon ben Gamliel. Um, when in later years you, uh, Yehuda Nasi raised objections to Yosef's opinions, he would say, We poor ones undertake to attack Yosef, though um, our time compares with him as the profane with the holy. Uh, Rabbi Yudha Nasi hands down halacha by Yose in uh, Menachot 14 Omud Alev. Uh, uh, Rabbi Yudha Nasi studied also from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in a place called Tekoa. 
some people have identified this Takoa as uh, somewhere in Meron. He also studied with Loza ben Shamaya. Um, however, he did not study with Rabbi Meir. Uh, evidently, in consequence of the conflicts which distanced Meir from the house of the patriarch. However, he considered himself lucky even to have seen Meir from behind. Uh, another one of uh, Rabbi Yudanos's teachers was Nathan of Babylonia of Babylon, Babel, who also took part in the conflict between Meir. Uh, uh, and, the, and the patriarch. Yehuda Anossi confessed that once in a fit of youthful ardor he had failed to treat Nathan with due reverence. Uh, in both halachic and agadic tradition, Rabbi Yehuda Anossi's opinion is often opposed to Nathan's. So, um, what did he say? That's a brief um, introduction to his upbringing and his, his mentors. So let's look at the Mishnah. Uh, Rabbi Omer, uh, Ezo hi derech Yeshua sheyova lo ha'adam kol shehi tiferet leose betiferet lo min ha'adam. Um, Rab said, which is the straight path that a man should choose for himself? one which is an honor to the person adopting it and on account of which honor to him from others and be careful with a light commandment as with a grave one for you do not know the reward for the fulfillment of the commandments Vahave Mechashev Haf said Mitzvah Keneget Sechora or Sechah Avera Keneget Haf Also, reckon the loss that may be sustained through the fulfillment of a commandment against the reward accruing thereby and the gain that may be obtained through the committing of a transgression against the loss entailed thereby. Vahistakel Beshloshadvarim Venata Bali De Avera Da ma le maala memacha, ayin roa, ve ozen shemaat, ve hol maasecha besefe nichtavim. Apply your mind to three things and you will not come into the clutches of sin. Know that what there is above you, an eye that sees, an ear that hears, and all your deeds are written in a book. So, a variety of concepts that are dealt out by uh, Rabbi Anasi. Uh, first of all, just to, just to browse over them, he asks, which is the correct path to take in which you are honoured and others honour you? In other words, which is, the, which is the middle path that you don't seem extreme to yourself and you don't seem extreme to others? Um, I'm going to give Rambam's commentary on that. Uh, he also, the second concept is how you must be careful between um, your, uh, your, 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 your measure, how you measure what is a hard mitzvah or a strong mitzvah as against a weak mitzvah or kind of soft mitzvah, one that's harder to fulfill or one that's more difficult to fulfill. Because the, as we know, we are given the various um, punishments for not keeping sins or transgressions, but we are not given the exact matan for keeping mitzvot, except for two mitzvot, which are honoring your parents, which you are given, uh, your days will be lengthened, and also uh, the, the shooing away of the birds, shilua haken, Again, you're offered the same thing, uh, that your days will be lengthened by keeping these two positive mitzvahs. The others, we have no idea. So we've got to very carefully judge what is important or what we think is important in God's eyes. God may um, uh, consider something that you seem very, very easy um, or very, very natural mitzvah. He may consider it a huge mitzvah. 
and something that you feel is a huge undertaking by yourself, you may say, you know what, it's not such a big deal, you know, you should have kept this one. Um, but we'll go into that in greater detail. And the last thing, and also he, he does, he, he, uh, he mentions you should be careful of the, um, uh, of the uh, mindset you have when committing sins, you know, that the, 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 the great loss, you must measure the loss of committing a sin and also you must also consider the um, uh, momentary loss when you, can, when you perform a mitzvah like for example if you give tzedakah if you feel you're perhaps out of pocket you know you must understand that huge treasures are waiting you in Olam Haba and the last thing a very complex it's a very very loaded Mishnah uh, he says know that there is above you an eye that sees an ear that hears and all your deeds are written in a book here we're talking about how Hashem is constantly with you and it's a, it's a concept that a lot of people don't appreciate and we'll go into that a little bit further but uh, later on but I'm going to start with um, Rambam's uh, commentary in full and then we'll continue with, the, with some other things so Rambam I quote Rambam it is clear that the straight path is the good actions which we have elucidated in the fourth chapter of Shemona Parakim which we uh, which we have been through in this uh, in this series in the last series, and they are the virtues of moderation. As the person requires a fine disposition, and you will have a good way with people. And he said it is praiseworthy for the person adopting it, and praiseworthy to him from other people. And afterwards, he said that he needs to be careful with the commandments that he thinks as light, like. Uh, Rejoicing in a in a Jewish holiday and the study of the uh, holy tongue, so to speak, Torah. As with the commandment, the great weightiness of which is clear to you, um, like uh, bris milah or wearing a tzitzit and uh, slaughtering of the Pesach korban. And there, the reason for this is for you do not know the reward given for the fulfillment of the respective commandments and the elucidation of this matter is as I will say and it is that the entire Torah has a positive commandment and negative commandments it is true that Torah elucidated the punishments of each negative commandment except for a few of them and one is obligated the death penalties for some of them and excision and death at the hands of uh, Midei Shomayim and lashes for some of them and we know from all of the punishments of the negative commandments which of the prohibitions are great and which ones of them are below them. And they are, he describes and Rambam describes now, there are eight levels. First level, and which is the greatest of them, are those things which one is um, obligated stoning. And the one below it, the seventh level, is the one that obligates burning. And the third are the ones that obligate killing by decapitation. And the fourth are the ones that obligate strangling. And the fifth are ones that obligate excision, cherim. And the sixth are the one, or sorry, and the sixth are the ones that obligate death at the hands of heaven. And the seventh are the ones that obligate lashes. And the eighth are negative commandments for which we do not give lashes. And from these levels we can know what is the weightiness of a sin or its lightness. But what is the reward from Hashem uh, of each of the positive commandments is not elucidated. And all of this is so that we do not know which commandment requires that we keep it much and which commandment is below it. Rather Hashem commanded to do uh, matter X and Y and he, Hashem did not make known the reward of which of them is greater from Hashem. And because of this, one needs to be careful about all of them. And because of this principle, they say in Sukkah 25 on Mad Aleph, one who is engaged in the commandment is exempt from another commandment. So without comparing the weight of the commandment that he is involved in to the other's one from which he is to the other one from which he is refraining. And for this they also say in Pesachim 64 on the base, we do not skip over commandments. Meaning to say that when you have a chance upon a, when you chant upon the performance of a commandment, do not skip over it and leave it to do another commandment. And afterwards he said that even though 
the relative desirability of each commandment is not elucidated, there is an angle of comparison. And that is that every positive commandment where you find that one who transgresses this is obligated a great punishment, <coughs> know that there is also a great reward in doing the commandments. An example of this is the brismila, or slaughtering the paschal lamb, uh, resting on Shabbos and making a parapet, a makkah, all positive commandments. Yet the obligation of one who does not, who does work on Shabbos, is stoning. But the one who refrains from circumcision or the sacrifice on Pesach is obligated only excision. And one who places blood on his house by refraining from setting up a makkah, makkah, violates a negative commandment without a tangible punishment. And that is which is stated in Devorim 22.8, do not place blood in your house. And from here, you know that the reward of Shabbos is greater than the reward of bris milah. And the reward of circumcision is greater with God than the reward of making a makkah, makkah. And that is the matter of his saying, also weigh the loss that may be sustained through the fulfillment of the commandment against the reward that may be obtained for fulfilling it. And he also said, the gain of a transgression. When you do not do it, this too is not elucidated. However, you can learn it from the punishment of the sin. When the sin for which the sinner was punished is great, the reward for his refraining from it, according to that level of greatness, as is elucidated in Kedushin 39 Omid base is there saying, and I quote, anyone who sits and does not commit a sin is given a reward like the one who does a commandment, end quote. And we have already explained it there. And the expression of the Torah of actions being known to him, Hashem, may uh, is like that when our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, Oliver Shalom, stated from your book that you have written. So that, that concludes the commentary of Rambam. So what Rambam is saying, that uh, Matan Scha is not known to us, um, but you know, if we wish to find out, if we wish to know um, what potential Matan Scha there is for any uh, positive commandment, we must look at the negative um, repercussions of, for example, uh, not keeping Shabbos. The inverse of the punishment is your reward. So. It's an, uh, so that's, that, that's the, the concept that we work by, the theory that we hold by. And it's interesting, but um, I, ha I have an like a insight uh, that I had this morning that I'd like to share with you. Uh, when I woke up, I woke up to a voice message from a friend of mine, Chaim Farkas, uh, who was uh, taking a walk, I think, on the beach in Tel Aviv, and he was listening to this last week's episode on Torah Anytime. And he was saying how much he was enjoying the shiurim that, that we are preparing. And uh, and I had a bit of an insight because I was thinking this morning, I was take, also taking a walk in Regent's Park, and I was thinking about this this first Mishnah and the, the concept of, um, of taking the inverse of a negative uh, transgression and looking for the matan scha that would hopefully be gleaned from it um, gleaned from the positive so i was i was thinking back to i think it was it was either hilchat shuva about loshon hora or in hilchat deot recently uh, we learned that rambam says that uh, when you tell loshon hora you are guilty of three things combined value of three things. Number one, you are guilty of murder, or the equivalent of murder. Number two, you are guilty of idolatry. And number three, you are guilty of immorality. And those three things combined, you are dealt the punishment for when you talk lush and horror. And, and uh, perhaps I think in a later chapter, they, Rambam also talked about when you... Uh, when you speak Lashon Hara, you actually harm three people, parties. Yeah. parties. Mm -hmm, yeah. The first is the one who says it. The second is the one who listens to it. And the third is obviously the one that you tell Lashon Hara about. And, um, and it continues to say that the one who gets punished the most 
quite puzzlingly, is the one who listens to it. So and you wonder, why is, it, uh, why is the one who listens to it the most guilty and the most deserving of punishment? And we learn if, uh, in, a, in that perek uh, that the one who listens to it actually energizes or br become, br brings an audience to the Lashon Hara and actually actualizes the reality and actually brings it into reality. Uh, he must obviously immediately say, I don't listen to this, it's not, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not interested. But if he doesn't and he listens to it, he energizes what's being told. So if you take this concept of the inverse of the transgression, you can also apply it to what we're doing today. Uh, Rav Mashiach and I are delivering these uh, shiurim on Torah anytime. And because of the uh, audience, yourselves, who are listening to our shiurim that we prepare, you must consider yourself as in the same way that a uh, person that listens to Lashon Hara is guilty of uh, threefold, uh, or, or guilty obviously um, of, 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 a, of a huge, huge punishment. When you listen to Lashon HaKodesh, you are also more worthy than the one who told the Lashan Tov or the Lashan HaKodesh. So this is, you must consider that when you listen to Shiurim on Torah anytime, that you are, your Matan Schar is far greater than our Matan Schar because you are the audience. You're taking the time out of your day to listen to what we have to say and you energize our words, which is very important to remember. And so, what's, let's continue. Well, before, let me just interrupt and and, um, and, and add to that fantastic uh, chidush. Very pleased that you said that. It just occurred to me, I always had an issue when thinking about Lashon Ara that I can understand the one who speaks gets punished. I can understand the one who listens gets punished. What's the what, what's the the problem with the guy who the subject of the lashon hara? He didn't. What did he do? He's completely passive. You know, why should he get punished? What's he done? So you talk about uh, Chaim. Uh, you know, you, you, you know Chaim. I don't like Chaim because of this and that. What's that got to do with it with Chaim? Chaim. You know. So if you if you take this chiddush a little bit further and you say that the one, the subject of the Torah discussion, as Michael just mentioned, um, uh, would, on the reverse side, would get a reward. Why would you, why, uh, why would you get a reward? Because the subject of our shiurim are all the Rabbanim in, in the Pirkei Avot, or the Tanaim, we talk about the Rambam, we brought Rabbeinu Yonah, Rashi, Rav, Ruachaim, M many many commentaries and because we are talking about them they are also part of the reward it says um, 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 something like that their lips move in the grave because they wrote this forum that we're talking about and the commentaries that we're talking about they get a reward and the reverse of that would be if we speak about somebody, God forbid, uh, Lashon Ara, then the subject will also get, get, get a punishment. And again, the positive aspect is we're speaking about the Rambam, etc. Because they wrote beautiful works, work, uh, holy works. But at the same time, I wonder, and this is only my idea, I, I definitely can't verify it, that this could be the reason why the subject of the uh, uh, Lashon Ara would, would get punished. Because he... It's almost like passively, he's engendered the, he sort of engendered the um, Lashon Hara to come about. Like if, it, if, okay, maybe it's not his fault, but because of him, he's the subject. If we didn't have a subject, we couldn't yeah, speak to yeah, Lashon Hara. That's a very good point. But, but also, but, but still, but it, it, nobody asked, I mean, I, I didn't ask you to speak Lashon Hara about me. But it could be that maybe his position or the fact that he didn't make himself immune from Lashon Aram, 
That's why they spoke Lashon Hara about him. And I'll, I'll demonstrate what that is very quickly. I don't want to in, take too much time. But very quickly, Yaakov Avinu, when he met with Paro um, in the times of Yosef, and Paro said, how old are you? And Yaakov Avinu replied, oh, it, the, the years of my life were long and hard, etc. And uh, from this, because he spoke negatively, the Mepharshim tell us that Yaakov Avinu, because the whole episode there was, was uh, um, 33 words that Yaakov Avinu spoke. And because of that, uh, 33 years were taken off from Yaakov Avinu's life. All the Avot were supposed to live to 180. Avram Avinu lived 175. He was five years taken off because so you wouldn't see the, um, the Esau went bad. Yitzhak lived 180 years. That was the paradigm. Yaakov lived 147. 180 minus uh, 33 is 147. So you can ask, okay, every word he said, he had a di- uh, another year taken off his life. But you look at Yaakov's reply, it was only 28 words. Or 27 words, I can't remember. I think it's 28 words. So why, why 33 years were taken off? That's five extra. So you have to understand that the five extra years were taken off because Paro asked him, uh, uh, how old are you? Veoma Paro, well, I can't remember the exact words. Those were five words. Why on earth is Yaakov Avinu responsible for what Paro said about him? Who cares? It's his reply that he should get pulled up, um, pulled up on. Who cares what Yaakov, uh, Paro said about him? But the answer is, if Yaakov wasn't looking looking sullen and and sad and miserable. Paro wouldn't have said what he said. He wouldn't have asked him, what, how old are you? He wanted to know, you look, you look very haggard. I want to know how old you are. If Yaakov had a smile on his face, he had a geschmack, he had a bren, as they say in Yiddish, Paro wouldn't even have asked. So Yaakov is responsible for his reply and the question that necessitated the reply. So perhaps you could say the same thing about Lashon Ara. If the subject of the Lashon Ara did not necessitate us talking about him. He was Mr. Perfect. Nobody speaks about Mr. Perfect. Then maybe you could say that, uh, that his, like, the fact that he, he made himself almost like a Kaylee for Lashon Hara, that's why um, the people spoke Lashon Hara about, about him. It's a stretch, I know. It's, I haven't verified this anywhere. I could be completely off the mark. I just thought I'd say it just in case it, it might be true. Wonderful. Wait, so... Um Okay, so uh, if we continue um, with the next concept, um, also uh, it says, "Vahave machavesh machashev hafased mitzvah keneged sechara or secha avera keneged hafseda," and also reckon the loss that may be sustained through the fulfilment of a commandment against the reward accruing thereby, and the gain that may be obtained through the committing of a transgression against the loss entailed thereby. And here he says. For example, if you give tzedakah and you feel as if, you know, you want to give tzedakah but you feel you're going to be, you're going to be short of money at the end of the month if you give tzedakah, uh, don't worry too much. When you, if you give tzedakah, know that it's going to be given back to you a thousand folds in Olam Haba. So it says don't worry too much about the, uh, the that. And also, co- conversely, don't think that the temporary pleasure of committing a transgression uh, you know, you should weigh it against the tremendous uh, punishment that you will get. It's not worth it for this momentary pleasure or this uh, the words of Lashon Hara that you will the momentary you know feeling of grandeur to get to say that you've you know to you, that you know something somebody else doesn't against the tremendous punishment you will receive. And the last concept is very deep. It is it says Mistakel the Shlosha Devarim. The en ata ba lide avera. Apply your mind to three things, and you will not come into sin. Da ma lemaala mimcha. Know what is above you. Ein roa the ozen shemaat. An eye that sees and an ear that hears. The chol maasecha ba sefer nichtavim. And all your deeds are written in a book. So this is a very deep concept. You should and you should know the Hashem is above you. And not only is he above you, he's all around you. And more than that, he's within you. 
uh, it's a very, very hard concept to comprehend that he gives you 100% uh, commitment, or, or rather he gives you, his, he concentrates on you 100%. He watches every single one of your deeds or misdeeds. And you can think to yourself, how is that possible? How can something, if he's watching me 100%, how can he be watching my neighbour? 100% or if he's watching my neighbor 100% how can he be watching me and you may start to doubt you know maybe he's not watching how can he be watching me the whole time and when you have these doubts and if you are of a mindset that is not correct that you want to avoid the light the eye of Hashem and you'll find yourself in dark hidden places and they will lead you to bad things but there's something that I'd like to say a concept that may be true and I think it is true but even if it's not true it's a good way to live your life you should imagine that Hashem is watching you through your own eyes so what you see so he's watching and he obviously we know he knows all of our thoughts so why is it so improbable that he's watching us through our eyes he when we look at something he's looking at that with us and that's a beautiful way. Sometimes if you are not of the right mindset, that you may be a little bit upset to hear that. But if you are of a holy disposition, you perhaps can be liberated by the thought of every time that you're sitting and learning with somebody, your eyes are on your safer, Hashem is watching through your eyes. Mm -hmm. And he's seeing, and also when you look at this beautiful nature and you're appreciating Hashem's handiwork, he is also appreciating that you appreciate yeah. his handiwork. Wow. He watches you through your eyes. So, and it also stops you looking at some of the bad things that you perhaps, or the bad thoughts that you're having when you, when you realize that Hashem is watching everything, every moment of the day. And, and you wonder, if that's the case, why doesn't he make it known? Why doesn't he uh, perhaps make it more obvious that that's the case? It would be perhaps a little bit difficult to, to, to live a life or live your life really, uh, it would be tough. It wouldn't be impossible, but it would be tough if you knew that God was, every single moment was, uh, was there. Maybe that's why he doesn't make it too obvious, but he's there and he watches everything. He analyzes what you are, every text you send. He's watching, he's watching all fingers pump on the, on the phone when you're sending a, te a text. So make sure that you don't send bad texts. Mm. Um, also, when you read something beautiful, he's reading it along with you. Um, so there are, there are, there are, you know, you should um, accept what reality is. He hears what you, when you speak to people, he hears exactly what you're saying. And also, when you're, when you're performing teshuva, he notices the fraction of a change in your character and he, he understands you're getting better and he appreciates and he makes things in your life so there's an immediate response to even the minute differences in your ways of thinking he acknowledges everything and you have to accept that and also it says and all your deeds are written in a book so be confident that every mitzvah that you perform is recorded and it is in your bank in Olam Haba and and he keeps it for you written down so it's scri inscribed into something permanent but also beware that if you commit uh, Averas they are also noted and because Hashem is perfect justice he has to mete out punishments but as we learned in uh, I think it was Hilcha Tshuva, the Yuaveiras are kept in a leaky bucket mm. and they are, they, as long as you don't add to them, they are disposed of, Hashem disposes of them. So I think that concludes the first Mishnah uh, and look forward to delivering the next one. Wow, thank you so much Michael. What a cracking introduction to the second Perik. I can't wait to get to Mishnah 2 and the rest of the Mishnah in this Perik. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Just remember, as Michael said, your sakhar is unbelievable. So we look forward to you getting more sakhar next time when we meet. Thank you so much.